Okay, I think we can begin. Um, good afternoon, every, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to Political Science 303, um, Comparative Politics of Advanced Industrialized Countries. Uh, my name is Tolga Bölükbaşı, and I'll be with you throughout this term. Um, let me briefly introduce myself to you guys before I, I continue um, with the material that I've prepared for this morning. Um, I studied economics at the Middle East Technical University, uh, which is right next door to Bilkent. Then I, I, um, I did a master's in economics, so I continued with economics. Um, then I thought, OK, where does power lie? Um, power, politics, those concepts. I've always been intrigued by these concepts. Um, then the question of who gets what, when, and how. Although these questions were always subsumed under uh, my undergraduate degree courses in economics, I thought, hmm, let me look for these questions, and in fact, answers to these questions elsewhere. So I <clears throat> did my PhD in sociology. Um, and, um, and there I learned more about, you know, where does politics lie? Where does power lie? How does politics play out? Um, then I came back to uh, Turkey. I started working at Bilkent in 2009, uh, around this time of the year. Um, and, and I've been here um, since then. Um, and I've been quite happy with, uh, with Bilkent students. Um, and I've been, from my first year, I've been teaching Political Science 303, uh, Comparative Politics of Advanced Industrialized Countries. I see this course as more of a mature course, and I enjoy doing it. Um, I've been enjoying doing it with, with my previous students, and I really hope that you guys will, will enjoy doing it with me. Um, so, um, what does this course entail? Um, this course is on advanced industrialized countries. Political Science 304 will be covering uh, the developing world. So, so in this course, uh, we'd, we'll, be, we'll be focusing on advanced democracies. Uh, what about these democracies? How do we understand politics? How do we compare politics in these, in these democracies? Um, we'll do it in five parts. In part one, we'll look at historical legacy. What does history tell us about um, contemporary politics? What, what, what lessons can we draw from uh, historical milestones in these countries? Uh, how did the state tradition emerge and evolve in these countries? So that's roughly part one um, after a short introduction. Then in part two, we'll be dealing with political economy. Um, political economy of economic and social policies. How did these countries develop in time um, economically? What kinds of models, what kinds of policy styles have they developed? Um, and what, what kinds of policymaking traditions emerge in these, in these cases? Um, after having you know, surveyed political economy of these countries, we then started off with uh, we will start off with governance and policy making. Uh, and here we'll focus on uh, you know, the executive and the relationship of the executive with the other branches of government, i.e. the legislative branch and the judicial branch. So we'll look at the interactions between uh, the, you know, the executive and its relationship with um, with the other branches. And here, uh, we'll focus on what kind of an executive do we have in this country? Uh, what kind of a political system we have in this country? Are we talking about a presidential system? Are we talking about a parliamentary system? Are we talking about a semi-presidential system? Um, and who gets what, when, and how? How, does, how do these questions get resolved in these um, processes? Um, in the fourth section, we'll look at representation and participation for each country, for each case study we shall be focusing on. And here, um, we'll be dealing with, um, we'll start with political parties, party systems, uh, 
um, electoral systems, electoral regimes, um, you know, whether we have a multi-party system, whether we have a two-party system, um, or a predominant party system, not this, not this term, but in the next term. Um, in addition to political parties, what are other institutions of representation, interest representation, voice articulation? Um, what are interest groups like? What are uh, social movements like? What are contemporary social movements like? So, so, um, so basically representation and participation, political participation. Um, and finally, we'll look at, we'll survey contemporary issues. Um, what do we, what, what, what really capture? Uh, what kinds of issues really capture uh, contemporary papers? Uh, what are the issues that surface in the political, economic, social, cultural agendas of these very interesting cases? Um, so, so, so in, these, in this part, we focus on um, some topical issues, some thematic areas, uh, depending on the case we shall be um, covering. So um, basically, advanced industrialized countries, um, their politics, their economies, um, the relationships between their, their you know, um, political systems and, uh, and also their markets. Um, the course, in fact, comes in two parts. In the first part, we'll do an introduction. So that happens right before everything I just um, um, discussed. In the first part, we'll do a conceptual introduction to comparative politics, the scope of comparative politics, which I hope to cover in the next hour. Um, and then we'll be focusing on um, three other, or two other um, main concepts. First, we'll deal with democracy. I'm sorry, first we'll deal with um, um, the modern state. How did the modern state evolve? Where did it originate from? How did it originate from? Uh, or, or how did it originate? How did it get developed across time or over time? Um, where did it start? Um, after this conceptual introduction to the modern state, the emergence and evolution of the modern state, um, we'll talk about um, democracy. First, a conceptual introduction to democracy, different types of democracy. But before different types of models of democracy, we'll discuss at a little bit of length, a little bit of detail, uh, what democracy is, what democracy is not, with the help of um, Schmitter and Karl's classic article that appeared in the early 1990s. So, um, so comparative politics, a quick introduction, then comes um, the modern state, then um, democracy, um, procedural aspects, the rules of the game, when democracy becomes the only game in town, to paraphrase Juan Linz, and then followed by types or models of democracy. Um, then all of this conceptual introduction will be focusing on each and every of these five cases. We'll start with Britain. Then we'll continue with um, France, followed by Germany. Um, then US, followed by Japan. Um, normally, I cover uh, Japan at the last, you know, as, as, the, as the last case. Uh, we'll try to, I'll try to cover the US case first, I mean, as the fourth case. Uh, and then I'll conclude with the case of Japan because of the timing of the US elections. So, so when you guys will be thinking, reflecting on the US elections in uh, November, we'll start talking about the US case instead of talking about the Japanese case. Um, my aim here in this class, ladies and gentlemen, is to make you think about um, first, conceptual tools. What are the different concepts that we need to learn on comparative politics of advanced industrialized countries? Um, what is governance like? What is participation like? What are the electoral systems like? Party systems like? Uh, what are the certain regime characteristics of, this, of these political economies? 
um, policy styles, administrative traditions, policy making traditions, economic policy making processes, dynamics, actors, um, social institutions, um, social um, movements, interest associations, and all of these. Um, so, so basic concepts. So what are these concepts? Um, I'd really like you to think about these concepts, reflect on these concepts. And then once we cover these concepts, a little bit of empirical information about each case. We have about uh, two weeks to cover each case. That means about six hours, um, so six, six meetings. Um, it's a little bit of time, but we'll try to cover most of the basics all together. So we'll, we'll, I hope to have a little bit of discussion time with you guys to, to go over these, um, these empirics. And here, um, once we discuss these, I really want all of you, or each of you, to be able to make your um, informed and discriminating judgments on the current topics, um, current issues, um, contemporary themes we discuss in this course. So I want you, by the end of this course, to make your own intelligent, educated judgments about what's out there um, in day-to-day -day politics and contemporary discussions. So um, having talked about um, the objectives in this course, let me briefly go through our contract, um, course organization-wise. Um, the course will, will rest on um, a set of readings, um, at the center of which lies um, our textbook, which is a very successful textbook, widely used in North America and elsewhere, um, which is titled An Introduction to Comparative Politics, Political Challenges and Changing Agendas by Kesselman and Krieger and Joseph. Um, we've got the 2014, um, or the edition that was available in 2014. I'm sure it is being updated as we speak. Uh, so so next, next year, uh, we'll probably be using a newer edition. Um, in addition to the textbook, we'll be uh, also reading a selection of articles. Um, and here, um, and this, this is reserved for the, for the first part, the, the, main, the main part one, um, where we'll be focusing on first the states, the modern states, early modern states, or early states and modern states. Um, this will be followed by, um, as I said, democracy, um, as a, you know, in terms of procedures, which would be followed by um, types and models of democracy. And here, we'll be uh, relying on three articles, uh, or three pieces, um, all of which are, are seminal pieces. The first piece is by Henrik Spirit, a Dutch-American political scientist, um, who writes on the modern state, the historical origins and, the, and evolution of modern states. Uh, this will be followed by um, Schmitter and Karls, Philip Schmitter, Terrell and Karls' seminal article that, that appeared in the early 1990s uh, on what democracy is and is not. And, um, and then, finally, we'll be talking about um, Arendt Leipart's piece, uh, a Dutch political scientist piece, um, on models of democracy, consensual and majoritarian systems. Um, so, in addition to these journal articles, I really would like you would, would like to invite you to go over the papers, uh, daily papers. I would like to emphasize. Um, please have a look at Financial Times. Um, I really also um, would recommend The Economist, which really reviews um, what happens in the past week. Um, every Thursday. So, so, um, so in addition to the class material, um, the textbook, and the journal articles, please have a look at these, um, these daily newspapers, which I hope will familiarize yourselves uh, with day-to-day um, -day topics, thematic issues, contemporary issues that we discuss um, in these countries. 
Um, the readings will be complemented by lectures. Um, in the first couple of weeks, I'll try to do, I'll try to cover a lot of material. But when we come to the cases, I'd like to rely on you uh, more and more um, after we break the ice. So, um, so the first couple of weeks, I'll do most of the talking. Um, I acknowledge that. I'm, I'm not too happy with it, but that seems to be uh, the case. Um, I've been doing this course at Bilkent for the past uh, six, seven years, so, so my, my, my experience shows me that it's, it's mostly um, in the first couple of weeks I do most of the talking. Uh, so I will, I really hope to rely on you guys as we, um, as we crack open in time. Um, and then in the, as, a, as a third um, element of the course, we'll be focusing on um, an audiovisual material, mostly a documentary, uh, to cover, to address some topical issue, um, some contemporary political theme uh, that, that we discuss in these countries. And we'll, we'll have in-class assignments on these. Um, in terms of course requirements, um, participation, I value participation. If we as a class learn your name or we, we, we get used to hearing your, your voice in class, that means you're, you're participating actively and effectively. That means you're going to have um, your 10% your um, from, from there. Um, second, we'll have in-class assignments to be written in class based on the audiovisual material that, that we'll be sharing with you. Um, these are going to be short assignments, uh, which will take about 20 to 30 minutes to write. Um, we do them in class. We either show you an audiovisual material, or we ask you uh, to view remotely this, this particular material. And, um, and, and I'd like to learn what you make of this material in the in-class assignment. Um, then comes your quiz, which will appear at the end of part one. Um, the quiz will be, you know, will we'll count 15% um, for your final grade. Um, it'll be a standard sit-down um, written exam type quiz. Uh, you'll, get some to ha you'll, you'll get to have some choice um, depending on our pace. We'll see how it goes. Um, then will come the midterm exam and the final exam. The midterm exam will, will count 30% towards your grade and the final exam, which will be announced, the date of which will be announced by the rector's or the dean's office toward the end of the term, will count um, about 35% 35, 35 of your grade. Um, so that's basically our contract. Um, that's basically the course requirements in this class. Um, let me do a quick tour of the course plan again. Um, part one, key concepts in comparative politics. What's the scope of comparative politics like? Um, the modern state, conceptions of democracy, um, and also types of democracy. And in part two, we'll delve into case studies. Um, and here, um, it's basically We'll cover state tradition in historical perspective, which will be followed by political economy of economic and social policies, where we'll look at the interaction of states and markets in each case, uh, governance and policy making, representation and participation, and um, we will end each case with contemporary issues, our current challenges facing uh, these countries. Now, um, what do we mean by comparative politics? This is going to be your first course at Bikent in the political science department, political science and public administration department on um, comparative politics. I'm sure you, most of you are familiar with these concepts, but let me just briefly um, discuss with you what we mean as comparativists by comparative politics. What's the scope of comparative politics like? Uh, the subject matter of comparative politics is basically the domestic politics, um, political economies, um, societies of, of all countries, as, as we shall be talking about. 
um, comparativists or comparative political scientists focus, focus, generally focus on big substantive questions such as what are the consequences of this type of electoral system in country A? Could we conceive of different outcomes in country B of a very similar electoral system? Um, what is interest, part interest representation and participation like? What are the political opportunity structures like in this particular country? How do they compare uh, with the political opportunity structures in, um, in the other country? Um, or what is inequality, or how does inequality feel like for an average citizen in this country? Um, what are the sources of inequality in this country? Is it race? Is it ethnicity? Is it language? Is it um, functional interests? Is it, you know, whether you have access to means to resources or whether you don't? Um, how, in, how do inequalities surface? Are they regional? Are they mostly ethnic? Are they class-based? Um, all of these questions will be those uh, that we try to answer as big substantive questions in comparative politics. In addition to you know, these questions, we sometimes see comparative politics as world politics. Uh, Monk and Snyder, two comparativists, reviewed the world of comparative politics recently, a few years ago, about um, eight, nine years ago, and they argue that comparative politics is the study of politics and political power around the world. Um, so so there, they talk about comparative politics as what, what really exists in different countries, in different regions, uh, in, across the world, all around the world. Um, let me now get help from Monk and Snyder uh, once again from their article on the substantive scope of comparative research. Um, there, um, I'd like to emphasize certain um, themes. They, they, they surveyed leading articles in comparative politics and um, they categorized, they typologized, they put into types um, a, in, in terms of the, sub, the main subject matter in these, um, these important articles appearing in these, these powerful journals. And uh, they arrive at, after their classification, they arrive at overarching subject matters. And they, you know, in a way, try to um, you know, look at you know, the comparative advantages of, of these, um, these journals, but also they try to divide um, they try to divide these thematic areas in terms of subject matter into, you know, um, into different topics. When we look at this, this slide, we see that more than half of all the articles that appear in these prestigious journals talk about democratic and state institutions. Uh, which was represented by over 50, 51 percent. Uh, and here uh, we see elections, voting, electoral rules, political parties, democratic institutions, including different branches of government, um, federalism and decentralization, you know, you know the nitty-gritty of the political systems, the judiciary, bureaucracy, military and police, and policy making in general. So, so um, they find that about 50% of all these articles are talking about democratic and state institutions. So that really um, tells us that this is the heart of um, comparative politics. Just following this by a small margin, by, by about 10 percentage points, comes economic and extranational processes. Um, 
economic policy and reform, which includes the welfare state, the developmental state, uh, writings on neoliberalism and varieties of capitalism, um, which really amounts to a more than quarter of the entire literature, um, contemporary literature on um, comparative politics that appear in these leading journals. Um, then comes economic development, globalization, supranational integration, and supranational pro um, processes. So, so these make about 40%, over 40% of all the articles that appear in these, these journals. And let me forewarn you that, that the, these will not add to 100 because of um, the overlaps. Um, then comes as the third subject matter area or overarching subject matter, uh, social actors. And here, um, they tell us that comparativists, you comparativists, focus on social movements and civil society, which includes uh, writings on um, social capital, strikes and protests, um, that we also focus on interest groups, which includes studies on business and labor. Uh, we also focus on citizen attitudes and political culture, religion, and also clientelism as a means of co-optation. So, so social actors, societal actors, make up about one third of all articles um, that appear in these, these journals. Um, then comes political regimes, uh, which are also quite popular. Um, they make up, they appear in more than uh, a quarter of, of all these writings. Varieties of political regimes, democratization and democratic breakdown. So, so what kinds of regimes are we talking about? Um, you know, different types, different models, processes of democratization, um, democratic stability and democratic breakdown. Um, and finally, which counts as about 18% um, of all these, these, um, um, these articles are on political order. And here we talk about state formation, uh, state collapse, wars, revolutions, nationalism, civil wars and violence, and ethnicity and ethnic conflict. So basically when we look at this once again, uh, democracy, democra democratic institutions, state institutions, um, a, a big chunk of um, what's out there, economic, pro um, economic processes, extranational processes, which includes economic policy, um, or economic policy making, globalization, and, and, and other issues. Then comes social actors, social movements, interests, associations, interest groups, citizens, political culture. Then comes political regimes, different types of regimes, demo uh, democracy, um, democratic stability, democratic breakdown, which is followed by order, um, states, revolutions, nationalism, civil war, and others. So, so um, they tell us, uh, they reveal that um, these are the overarching subject matters uh, in terms of the scope of comparative politics that, that we really focus on. Uh, all of us are thinking about these areas, mostly. Um, from here, I think we can start discussing the modern state. Um, but before that, let me briefly do a refresher with you on what we mean by states. States are so central to our lives. They're also central um, as a concept, as an organizing concept, in understanding the comparative politics of advanced industrialized as well as developing countries. Um, states in empirical reality have been the building block of the international system for centuries. So um, we still, dis I mean, we've been discussing, um, especially during the past two, three decades, whether the state is still relevant or the extent to which state as an organizational structure or a system of organizing society um, is still relevant to understanding um, domestic politics um, when we compare these systems. Um, but we, I think in mainstream political science, we've 
or comparative politics, we've come to the conclusion that state is not dead. Uh, we are still um, in or surviving the era of uh, states. There are many difficulties in characteris uh, characterizing what states are. Um, we can characterize states in historical variation, different types of states in history. Um, diverse functions, you know, from, from, um, from simple functions evolving towards a very diverse set of functions. So the functions of the state, which get reflected in different policies, have been proliferating ever since the states were invented as an organizational system or organizational structure. States come in diverse sizes um, from Andorra, from small states, micro states, um, to, to large states such as Russia, the Russian Federation. So size um, really varies, um, geography really varies. And states, yes, although we talk about the state in comparative politics, we take it as a central building block of the international system. We also are aware that states are not the only actors in the international system. Uh, states are, um, or side by side uh, states, or with states, there are also other political actors. There are big corporations. Uh, there are non-state actors, um, which, which really um, possess power and therefore, they, they really affect our day-to-day -day politics. Um, states also differ with respect to their level of recognition. Um, some states are fully recognized in the international community, in the eyes of the international community, uh, in terms of international public law. Some other states are not fully recognized, um, such as the case of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, or we can also talk about um, the case of Palestine, whether we have a Palestine, Palestinian state, uh, whether we can conceptualize uh, modern-day Israel as a two-state system or, or one single state. So um, whether or the extent to which um, states get recognized in the international system um, is also um, a source of variation or a reflection of their variation. States also form through different means. Some states um, form out of secession, such as the ex-Yugoslav um, states uh, or the ex-USSR states, the former um, um, USSR Soviet states. Um, some states merge and um, become other states. Uh, and there are history is, is replete with examples. And in characterizing the state, we also refer to other concepts such as um, country, nation, political system, nation state, empire. So, so it, it, states really come in different forms, different sizes, different shapes, um, and they entail different elements. And, and in this course, we shall be talking about these, um, these elements. Um, key concepts. I'm sure you guys are aware of these key concepts, but let me, I thought, uh, let me briefly touch upon these so that we have a level playing field uh, for us all to discuss these matters. Uh, state is an organization for the purposes of this course that issues and enforces binding rules for people in a given territory. And here we can talk about um, three elements. Territory is basically the geographical area that a state considers to be its own. And this has always been contested in the history of the modern state and pre-modern state. Um, we also talk about people uh, because it, the state enforces binding rules for its own people given its territory. People. Um, basically persons living together with um, a developed form of common consciousness and a form of common identity. And sovereignty um, is also another concept that, that features in these discussions. It's basically, or it can be basically de um, defined as 
the highest power that gives state complete freedom of action within its sovereignty. Uh, we can discuss two faces of sovereignty. One is internal sovereignty, so um, a state may enjoy sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis its own people, domestic actors. And we can talk about external sovereignty. A state enjoys external sovereignty in the eyes of other actors outside the state, in the, in the, uh, for example, in the international system. Um, let me also remind you Weber's definition here, um, classic definition of the state. Um, Weber defines um, late 19th century um, political economist, economic sociologist, um, political sociologist, Weber defines the state as an agency or a set of agencies that monopolizes legitimate use of physical force, legitimate use of coercion over its people. So um, if you want to remember one single definition of the state, I, I really invite you to remember Weber's definition here. Uh, a, an agency or a set of agencies that monopolizes legitimate use of coercion over its people. Um, when we look at the historical evolution of the state, um, let's start talking about the pre-modern state. What do pre-modern states look like? In the earlier periods, we see the emergence of large agrarian empires. Where did these large agrarian em empires emerge? These large agrarian empires emerged um, in Mesopotamia, um, in Egypt, um, parts of um, the Hellenistic um, Empire. Um, and these large agrarian empires were able to serve certain functions. These states, in a way, these pre-modern states, were able to keep records, were able to issue orders, were able to organize large-scale forces for, let's say, irrigation works, and also um, for war making. They were also exercised legal authority more or less within their own limits, within their own territories. Um, and here in Northwestern Europe and its adjacent areas, we see the emergence of the feudal state, um, which really premises upon personal ties of, of, of obedience and loyalty. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the feudal mode of production. You will remember from your previous courses what feudalism means. Um, in a nutshell, uh, when I refer to, when we refer to feudalism, as you shall be reading about in um, the, the origins and the historical evolution of the modern state in um, Henry Spirit's article, um, feudalism is a system of social networks and it's a system of bundles of rights. It's, it defines a system of bundles of rights. Here at the top we have uh, the king and below this king we have warriors, uh, military officers, and below these military officers we have a pyramid of other lords and Below these lords are the serfs. So in this system, um, we have um, relationships uh, which are systematized uh, based on a social order, uh, which is quite um, structured, so which is quite stratified, which is clearly stratified. And here we have systems of obligations, systems of loyalties against, um, you know, of, of actors against one another. Um, and, and here let me show you um, what I mean by these bundles of rights. Um, here we have the king, the primus inter pares, as you shall remember from your previous courses, and a military knight, a knight uh, where the king blesses the knight, where the king declares that you are my um, you know, protege, I will protect you, and the, the, the warrior says I will protect you in return. So um, this is a representation of uh, Charlemagne and, and 
Roland, Roland um, a Frankish military officer, a Frankish military knight, um, who lived in the 8th, 8th century. So a um, medieval period, um, feudal lord in a way, and the, the king is really throning a lesser king here. Um, and, and, he, and, and he, he declares I mean, he declares him uh, a knight. Uh, here is the plan of a medieval manor. We have the landlord, um, the military knight living here, the vassal. Um, here is this is, um, his house. Here is the church. Um, and, and here we have common pasture um, and, and planting areas, plantation areas. Um, some of which are left to fallow. Um, and, and here the serfs uh, till the land. And when they till the land, they, um, they submit some of their, let's say, bushels of wheat to the landlord. And in return, the landlord will protect them against uh, invasion and conquest. So, so here, um, so we have a bundle of rights and duties and obligations and responsibilities between the serfs and their protector, the landlord here, who happens to be a lord or a knight who, um, who is loyal to the king and the king is loyal to the lord. So, so this is what we mean by bundles of rights and responsibilities and systems of um, social networks. And here, um, in time, we see the transition within the pre-modern area, the transition from personalistic rule to formal authority. Um, and Spirit says, he really describes this period of pre-modern statehood, um, that early modern states ran wide. Yes, they ran wide. Um, these were large states, but they weren't deep. They didn't, they didn't have the penetrative ability that modern states have in the current, in the, in the modern period. Um, now we can talk about the modern state, what are uh, its, its main features. Um, modern states rest on sovereign territorial rule. Um, by the modern state here, let me talk to you about um, absolute states. That emerge, that started to emerge in the 14th and 15th centuries, um, depending on where you are. Um, absolute states had two main features, that they were characterized by um, territories, so they were territorial. Their boundaries were clearly, well, more or less clearly demarcated against one another. And that they were characterized by strong bureaucracies. Um, let me go back to this territory business. In the feudal times, we had we had different, um, different areas of power which may have had intersection sets. So Lord A and Lord B may be adjacent to one another, but their land, some of their land, was contested. And we had a Lord C which was right next to the land, or who had land right next to Lord A and Lord B, but within this land, another Lord, Lord D, probably a lesser Lord, D, claiming some sovereignty within this land. So as you can see, that this is a very messy picture. Um, as time passed, what happened was, after rounds of war making, 
B or B's, B's frontiers, boundaries um, of his land get more clearly demarcated against that of A. And D gets out of C's land, meaning that we have harder borders as time passes. So with the onset of the absolutist state, we have more clearly demarcated territorial borders. And we also had strong bureaucracies. And bureaucracies were of two types. One is, a, you know, one part of bureaucracy is the war making military bureaucracy. And the other part of bureaucracy was tax collecting bureaucracy. So, so absolutist states, early modern states, were states characterized by territories, clearly marked territories, and strong bureaucracies. So, so um, here, when we talk about the emergence of the modern state, we really talk about sovereign, more clearly delineated sovereign territorial rule and strong bureaucracies. And strong bureaucracies are uh, what, I, what I refer to as uh, the military bureaucracy and the tax collecting bureaucracy. Um, and within these areas, we see the emergence of more homogenous governance and formalized legal codes um, within these areas. Um, so within these areas of sovereign rule, we see um, some kind of a homogenization, formalization of uh, governance and codes. Um, when we come to the mo uh, more recent period, uh, late 18th century, we see modern states um, having higher levels of penetrative ability um, based on Napoleonic code, based on democratic ideals, uh, standardized weights, standardized measures, and standardized administrations. And of course, um, on top of these, modern states engineered public education. Um, that also helped them homogenize their, uh, their, what used to be subjects, now citizens, even further. And with universal conscription becoming the rule, we see the emergence of the nation state. So this is a process of nation building um, with the, um, the emergence, or after the emergence and consolidation of the modern state. Um, now I'd like to talk about, finally, um, state formation stages with the help of Steinrocken's framework. Uh, Steinrocken um, Nor is a Norwegian political sociologist, political scientist. Uh, he had very influential writings um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and there he talks about four stages of state formation. Um, state formation, he says, the first stage is the stage of penetration. So the state starts to penetrate into society after having consolidated its territories. So once territorial consolidation process is completed, the state builds institutions to control its own territory and to secure compliance um, of its, what used to be subjects, increasingly citizens, to its own. Uh, how did the state do this? The state built internal order or mechanisms or instruments of internal order. The state also um, delivered, in a way, uh, external security. It starts to extract resources not only extensively, but, all, but more intensively. It provides, builds infrastructure and improves communication within its territories. And states, by the end of the penetration stage, 
um, do develop clearly divided or clearly demarcated territories. So, so they really um, have much more clear uh, boundaries against one another. So that's stage number one. Stage number two is the nation building stage, which is um, all about standardization. So, so once we have um, clearly demarcated territories, once we build some infrastructure, once we develop certain policies um, to basically um, make subjects obey themselves, uh, we create a common identity and sense of allegiance among disparate populations. So this is the um, nation building stage, which is all about standardization. And here, uh, states develop national myths, um, national anthems um, about their shared identities, about their shared experiences, and their shared fate, shared destinies. Um, not only historical destinies, but destinies of the future. So, so they really try to develop, a, they really try to design a future altogether. Um, us um, being, um, you know, developing Id an, an identity and allegiance to the state. Um, and we, as the peoples of, in this country or in this state, can dream about a single future, a shared future. And the state also designs, um, invents, sometimes reinvents system symbols. So, so this is the... Um, this is the phase, this is a stage in which the state invents or reinvents or sometimes imagines communities. Um, and this is, by, by, by saying this, I refer to Benedict Anderson's um, imagined, I mean, seminal work on imagined communities. So this is the stage of standardization, um, of imagination, and juxtaposing this imagination invention, reinvention, production, reproduction of standard or standardization of, um, of people in a given state. Um, the third stage is mass democracies. Once we have the state penetrating into society, once we complete that stage, and we also standardize what's within our borders, the state's borders, the state now starts to equalize uh, what's out there. So beyond homogenization comes equalization, uh, where we, we witness masses conquering the right to participate in governance or government. Um, and this is the period also, or this is the phase, this is the stage in which we witness the expansion of universal suffrage. So this is the period of mass democracies. Um, this is the period where the state or states, modern states, um, engineer mechanisms, instruments um, to democratize the system. So, so this is the stage, once again, of equalization, argues Rockham. Um, and finally, the last stage in Rockham's framework is redistribution. This is, in a way, the latest stage in the, um, in the process of state formation. Um, welfare states emerge in this period. Um, we can talk about this you know, in terms of periodi periodization. Uh, we can talk about this um, by about the end of World War II, so second half of the 20th century, um, in which we see increasingly progressive taxation as an instrument of redistribution and state contributions um, helping the needy um, make a living. And uh, the state itself intervenes into markets uh, and plays the game of Robin Hood. Um, so it redistributes away from the wealthy to the poor. 
um, the state redistributes resources and it provides um, some goodies, not only in kind, but also invents a set of services to, um, to address the needs um, of, of its citizens. And finally, um, the idea behind this redistribution, Rockin says, is the goal of strengthening economic solidarity or socioeconomic solidarity. So all of these, once again, um, these state formation stages um, really bring us from the early modern state era, from the era of penetration, through standardization and equalization, and we arrive at redistribution. So, so these are the basic um, concepts that I wanted to share with you uh, before we begin to talk about um, democracies um, and also types of democracies, procedural aspects of democracy. Um, and I, I hope that this, you found this introduction helpful in refreshing your memories. And we shall continue with, um, with democracies next class. Thank you.